And we are live. Welcome, mystery and thriller fans. I'm your on-air host, Sarah DeBello, and I am so excited to welcome back for year three, number one New York Times bestselling author, Lee Goldberg, here to give us the inside scoop on the latest book in his Eve Ronan series, Movie Land, out tomorrow. Lee, welcome back. Tell Thank you so you. much. Thank you. I'm glad you dropped the restraining order. It's a pleasure to be here. It's only temporarily dropped, so talk okay. fast. <laughs> Lee, tell us about Movie Land. It's the fourth book in the Eve Ronan series. Eve Ronan is the youngest female homicide detective in the history of the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. And in this book, she's investigating a string of shootings in Malibu Creek State Park, which is a very popular state park and is also a former Hollywood studio backlot. So it has a lot of ghosts of movies past there and... She finds herself once again up against the corruption of the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, but also the demands and pressures of the media and the pressure she puts on herself. You don't have to have read the first three books in the series to appreciate this one. At least I hope not. <laughs> um, but it's based on a real series of shootings that happened here in Calabasas and Malibu Creek State Park. But mm. I put my own spin on it. Ooh. Now, Lee, as someone who I lives... Oh, what's alive. happening? Welcome. What? Whoa, I had a weird echo there. Um, Lee, so as someone who lives in L.A., are you nervous about poking the L.A. County Sheriff's Department in this way? What if you turn up? <laughs> uh, I get emails from police officers and especially sheriff's deputies all the time telling me how accurate my book is. My books are. What's interesting is... The Lost Hills station of the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, which is my local station and the station where Eve Ronan is based, hasn't been helpful to me at all. They, they won't answer any of my questions. They won't let me be on the front door. Um, they've been totally uncooperative. Any information I've needed to get about the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, I've had to get by interviewing deputies or having my own local city council members pressure the local uh, sheriff's department to give me what I need. So they've been very, very standoffish. But what's interesting is I've had friends of mine, politicians who've gone into the Lost Hill Sheriff's Department and have told me that on the captain's back shelf are all three of the previous Eve Ronan novels. <laughs> so I know I know they're reading them. I think you should go in there and offer to sign them, Lee. That might help. I, I should. I that should. might help butter you up. Um, so I had to make up what the inside of the station looks like. But since most readers haven't been in there either, no one's going to really call me on it and say, now, wait a minute, that hallway doesn't veer left, it veers right. Or the, yeah. you know, I've taken many liberties with the, the interior of that station and the cops who are based there in, in the purpose of telling my story. Ooh. Well, I can't wait to get into the telling of the story. Uh, first, I just want to welcome everyone who's watching. We are, of course, broadcasting live to six different destinations across Facebook and YouTube. So no matter where you're watching from, you're in the right place. This is the right time. And it is a mystery Monday because, you know, Mondays can be murder. I want to welcome Bonnie to the conversation. Anita, Polly, Alan, Arlene, Jonathan, John, uh, Tom, I hope I didn't miss anybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Arlene is saying, I can't wait to read this. I know it releases tomorrow. Yes, Arlene, it releases tomorrow. So Thank I'm gonna you, Arlene. I'm so glad someone's looking forward to it besides me and my <laughs> wife. <laughs> and me, Lee. And you, and you. Three whole people plus Arlene. No, everybody is so excited. Um, and so I want to, uh, I'm so glad you're tuning in. Arlene, tell us um, if you've read the other books in the in the uh, Eve Ronan series. Tell us what you're excited about. And I'm going to drop the pre-order link in for everybody to check out. So here it is. Um, grab your pre-link, grab the your pre-order your copy from our favorite woman-owned independent bookstore, Murder by the Book, and uh, and it'll be out tomorrow. Arlene is saying, I love mysteries. Yay, Arlene, you're in the right place. I love mysteries too. They're the best, right? My, my wife, who's French, I'm going to do a bad version of her accent. Let's hear it. If I die before my husband, I don't care if it's a meteor or a bus or cancer. I want a complete investigation because all he does is murder people all day and get away with it. You know, so... <laughs> <laughs> okay, you heard I sit here thinking about how to kill people and get away with it, book after book and script after script. Yeah, if a French wife turns up dead in the next in the next uh, 
Siri, the next iteration of Eve Ronan, I will be ner I would be nervous if I was your wife. Um, Bonnie, welcome to the conversation. I oh, I love your profile. Your profile picture. Hummingbirds are my favorite. And she's saying this is one of the best series ever. Yes, Bonnie, it's Thank so you, fun. Thank you, Bonnie. Right? That's very nice. You've you've just taken care of all my insecurities. Yay! Our I'm riven with them. You wouldn't tell by the smile on my face, but I'm sitting here riven with anxiety. <laughs> you look very anxious. Maybe you should have less Diet Coke. I mean, Shasta's. I like um, this. I'm all keyed up on caffeine. Yeah, Lee, I could do a commercial for Diet Shasta. It has Lee, sucralose. Lee's, Lee's 35 Shasta's deep into the day. Arlene <laughs> saying, I haven't read the other book. So Lee, let's pause on that. This is book four in the Eve Ronin series. Should people start at book one or is it okay it, to jump in on four? It's not necessary. You can jump in with any book. All the books stand on their own. Whatever you don't know is told to you in hopefully very short, sweet, and fast-moving exposition along the way. But no, you won't be lost. It might be a little bit richer for you if you've read the previous three books, but it's totally unnecessary. I know people who've read book three and then gone back and read book one and then book two or started with book two and three and then gone back and read book one. I'm very careful about not having spoilers and ruining the previous mysteries in my books. It's sort of like Harry Bosch. I mean, no one now can go back to Black Echo and start from the beginning. They start at book number 25 or 27, whatever it is, and kind of bump around between them. And I think that hopefully you can do the same with my books. Well, I loved the Harry Bosch reference um, in this one, Lee. Clearly, you're. I like. I love when there's little Easter eggs, as they as they call them, where there's little fun treats for us mystery lovers. Um, Lynn, welcome to the conversation. Saying, I am definitely intrigued by the fact that the sheriff's office is uncooperative. Uncoop they must have a good reason to be concerned. Lee, give us the. Scoop. Well, it's very interesting because in my second book, Bone Canyon, I talk quite a bit about the sheriff gangs, which are gangs within the sheriff's department of deputies who are tattooed and push the limits of legality and, and what they do. And it's been a big controversy here. And a lot of people, when I wrote Bone Canyon, when I actually published Bone Canyon, that's ridiculous. You're making this stuff up. There's no such thing. Well, it has exploded here. I wish I'd made it up. And the corruption that I depict in my Eve Ronan novels is a reflection of the real corruption happening here in Los Angeles. That's not to say there aren't terrific, wonderful sheriff's deputies. The vast majority of them are honest, hardworking, terrific law enforcement officers. But there are some people who are not. And in my view, it comes to the top. I think Sheriff Villanueva is a horrible, horrible sheriff. Um, but that's another. Though the, though the sheriff in my books is not Villanueva and is not that same kind of guy. Um, but we won't get into the politics. I just, I just want to do a hero who's not comfortably in her position at the police department, or excuse me, sheriff's department, who's often second guessing herself and being second guessed by others. I didn't want her to be entirely competent either. She makes huge mistakes. She's got the talent, but not the experience. She's not Harry Bosch yet. And for me, that makes the character fun to write and hopefully fun to read. Uh, very fun to read because Lee, uh, you um, you are funny. I always look forward to having one, and it, and you're funny on the page, which is something I also love about the, the dynamic between Donuts Duncan and and his 26 year old partner Eve. The the interplay between this two is is very funny, and the interplay between Duncan and the um, various other characters in the book is really fun. Um, Arlene saying, I might ha just have to go back and read the other books in the series. Absolutely, Arlene, um, keep well, us posted. Well, Humor. I'm a big believer that there's humor even in the worst situations. My books are not satires and they're not situation comedies either. But I find books that are humorless totally unrealistic because I know in some of the darkest, saddest, most painful moments of my life, there's also been a, a strain of humor um, that, that seems to come out of nowhere. That it, Not just because it helps you cope, but because life goes on around you, even when you're going through this stuff. And I can I could give you some examples of humor in my life during dark situations. But I, th I think that also allows you to take some of the dark stuff that you're reading, have it go down better. I love police procedurals, but to me, far too many of them are humorless, just humorless. And, and to me, that 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 pulls me out. It's like that's not that's not real. I just don't buy no humor in someone's life. So the humor, I hope comes out of character and not one-liners. It comes out of relationships and situations, not ba dum bum You don't hear, you know, a, a drum in the background signaling every joke. Because I, I don't write jokes. I, I write situations that 
the humor comes out of you know these characters and how they're dealing with what they're facing or it's about their relationship mm. it's probably a muddled way of explaining all that i hope i got my point across no, I, yeah, I really I agree because you have to be able to laugh in order to get through <laughs> anything, I think. Um, I love that. Um, Bonnie saying, yes, I'm always finding myself chuckling in your books. Me too, Bonnie. Me too. She's saying she just finished the Ian Lovelo oh. series last week. Um, well, that was much more comical. Yeah. That, that, that's, that, that is sort of a, it's a straightforward espionage novel, the Ian Ludlows, but they're also a spoof of the absurdity of, of, spy novels and i'm mm. fun at the reality versus the escapist version in the books and how one guy's caught between those two worlds the escapist reality that he writes about in the actual world of espionage that he's living in and that's where the humor comes in but mm. those books the ian ludlow uh thrillers true fiction killer thriller and fake truth are far more funny than the eve ronins and mm. i have had some pushback i have had people who who discovered me through the ian ludlow's who read the Eve Ronins and go, oh, wait a minute, this is this is much darker. Or people mm. who've read the Eve Ronins and then go read the Ian, Ian Ludlow's and go, oh, wow, this is more funny. Mm. I, I try to be more than a, not to use a cliche, but a one-trick pony. I, I like to try to write different things and have different levels of humor. I have another series of books I wrote many years ago, the Charlie Willis novels, My Gun Has Bullets and Dead Space, which are absolute, broadly silly, Carl Hyacin kind of books. And again, some of my Eve Ronan readers who go read those wonder if it were written by a different writer. Well, Lee, I have to say you are definitely a more than a one trick pony. Um, Arlene saying she also loves Bosch, both reading and watching the series. Lee, I know you're a big Bosch fan. Yes, I am. And I'm also very thankful for that book this way. Wonderful blurb that Michael gave me, uh, yes. heroin for the ages. He was really kind to me in the uh, uh, Eve Ronan series. And plus the reviews, they keep comparing me to Michael. I just had one yesterday in the Providence Journal saying that I was the equal of Michael Connolly and, and Robert Crace, maybe somewhere in the writing, but certainly not in the looks department. I think Robert <laughs> Crace had me beaten there. Speaking of reviews, uh, this latest Eve Ronan earned a starred review from Library Journal. Let's let's take a look at that. They raved that Goldberg's compelling follow-up to Gated Prey is a fast-paced, riveting police procedural uh, in, influenced by actual events in California, a character-driven series uh, entry that skillfully depicts Hollywood corruption. So first of all, congratulations on that that starred review, Lee. Thank you. Um, and now tell us what the secret is, um, what you've learned along the way about writing a fast-paced, riveting uh, procedural. What do you I've, think? I've used a lot of the techniques I've picked up in my career in television. If a scene doesn't reveal character and move the story forward, it's cut. If a scene doesn't have conflict, it's cut. And I let action and dialogue move the story forward rather than pages of internal thought and exposition. Also, I'm a firm believer in having it be tight. Um, I think too many authors over-describe things. I try to find the one salient feature of a person or a room or a place and, and say that and let the reader color between the lines after that. Um, I'm looking for the same pace that you get from a television show or a movie. And so I, I tend to mimic the act structure of a feature film. It's something that you internalize as a, as a reader and viewer and don't even realize it. But if my books can capture that same structure and momentum, I hope they'll carry you along in, in the same way. Now, Lee, you've done your fair share of TV writing, um, both the Monk series, uh, a flipper movie. Uh, <laughs> tell, tell us, tell us. Um, so I like the, I like how you a said. Flipper, well, first of all, it was a, a flipper TV series, but I, I've tried to excise that from my credits, just like the star of the show, Jessica Alba, has tried to do, but I haven't been quite as successful. I don't usually admit I've written for a dolphin. Not only have I written for a dolphin, I've written for two freaking dolphins. The one that doesn't talk in Flipper, and I wrote dialogue for a talking dolphin in Sequest for a season. You have not lived until you've written for a freaking dolphin. But yes, I have I have written a lot of television. I also co-created the Hallmark series Mystery 101, and a movie I wrote called Fast Charlie starring Pierce Brosnan is shooting right now in New Orleans. So I keep my hand in, in screenwriting as well as, as books.
Um, so, uh, so tell us, you know, you, so you're saying that you, I like how you said that you're looking for the same pace. This, every scene has to move the, has to move the, the story forward. Um, and, and, and that you, you want to reveal something about character. Um, is that what you think keeps people flipping those pages at that rabid pace? Yes. I think okay. if every scene has conflict. Yeah. If every scene moves the story forward. If every scene reveals character and I left one other element out if your protagonist is active your your protagonist is pushing the story forward your protagonist is not just sitting there having the story impact him or her they're impacting events then I think it brings the reader in and I'm very careful about point of view um, in the Eve Ronan books everything is essentially from her point of view the Ian Ludlow books that uh, I think Arlene or, or Bonnie mentioned earlier they're multiple points of view but you're clear that Ian is the central character. But I use those other points of view to give the reader, in some ways, an edge over Ian. There's that whole um, Alfred Hitchcock thing where you show the audience the bomb underneath the table that the hero doesn't know about, and it creates tension. I try to do something similar to that, where the reader might be just a little bit ahead of the protagonist, but then discover something they didn't know. Well, they think they're ahead of the protagonist. The protagonist is doing things that they didn't expect that impact the plot in a way you didn't expect. Mm. I'm a firm mm. believer in if um, someone tells me uh, Joe is missing, if I want to find Joe, I need to talk to Sarah. My hero should not go to Sarah and have Sarah say, yeah, you can find Joe at the 7-Eleven. <laughs> go to Sarah and Sarah says, I've never met Joe. And my, my cat was hit by a car yesterday. I really wish the police would focus on that instead of, and by looking into the cat that was hit by the car, they may have found out that Joe was in the neighborhood and actually hit the cat. And, 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 and so I like going at things from a left or, or right angle and not straight ahead. And I think that pulls the reader in as well. Ooh, thank you for that uh, insight. That I, I, I really like that. I get that. That makes sense in my brain. Lynn, welcome to the conversation, saying she loved Mystery 101. Oh, well, thank you, Lynn. It was fun creating that show. I mean, it's essentially a reflection of, of me in that the heroine is a, a woman who teaches crime writing in a university. And she uses everything she learned from all the fictional detectives that she's been teaching to solve crimes herself. The, the concept of the show has strayed away from that more than I would like, but that was the initial concept that, you know, she's picked up all this stuff from Hercule Poirot and Miss Marple and Harry Bosch and, and um, Kinsey Milhone that she tries to apply to real life. And some of it applies and some of it doesn't. And in that space in between, she discovers her own detecting skills and it helps that her father is a mystery writer as well. So it's the concept is one that uh, in some ways is similar to, to true fiction and Ian Ludlow, where Ian Ludlow is a guy who writes spy novels who finds himself suddenly in a spy situation himself. Mm, I love that. Uh, Publishers Weekly also weighing in with a strong review. Um, uh, oh, before I get to that, though, Mark, welcome to the conversation, saying he's also a big fan of Mystery 101. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Mark, for, for commenting and letting us know. Arlene saying, I have to leave, but watch later. Yes, Arlene. Well, if Arlene's leaving, I'm gone, too. It's been wonderful, <laughs> Sarah. Gone. We, Arlene and everyone else who has to go, the replays will be available on Facebook and YouTube. We got um, so no worries about that. They will there stay is up a forever. Car chase and a sex scene coming up. You're not going to want to miss. Exactly. Plus, if Lee says something embarrassing, it will live on in perpetuity. So don't. So be sure to come back didn't because I that will probably that? happen. Did, didn't I just do that? It, it, it's going to happen again more because oh, okay. I'm setting you up. I'm thinking five steps ahead. Okay. Uh, Library Journal, uh, sorry, Publishers Weekly also chiming in with bestseller Goldberg's strong fourth e Ronin mystery has assured prose that matches the tight plot. So uh, congratulations on that. Lee, let's talk about your tight plot. So are you a plotter? Are you a pantser? Are you uh, there with the big post-it notes? Are you handwriting like our previous guest, Tess Gerritsen? What's the, what's, what's the Lee Goldberg uh, process look like? I am a strong believer in outlining. It comes from my days in TV where you have to write an outline to get the approval to write the script. And while you're writing the script, the rest of the production is prepping the episode, casting, building sets, buying wardrobe based on your outline. So I'm a big believer in outlines. Plus this way, Steve Cannell, you know, created the A-Team and the Rockford Files. It has a good analogy. It's a difference between getting in a car and driving and getting in a car and saying, I'm driving to New York. And I'm going to take the 10 freeway most of the way. That doesn't mean you won't deviate, but at least you know when you sit down, you're going to New York. So when I write a mystery, 
I know who done it. I know what the clues are. And I pretty much know how I'm getting there. But I call my outlines living outlines because I'm rewriting them as I write the book. Because sometimes new ideas will come to me or <laughs> I'll leave a character alive that I meant to kill or suddenly drop a clue I didn't know I was going to drop. And I usually finish my outline about three weeks before I finish my book because I'm constantly revising the outline. But having that outline means you're not making it up as you go along. You can focus on character and dialogue and not on plot. That doesn't mean you're not replotting as you go because what sounds good in the outline may not work when you sit down to write the book. And it's the same way in scripts. I'll write an outline, I'll deliver a script that's true to the outline, and then we try to make this script in the real world in eight days, three days on your standing sets, six days out on location, whatever, and, and you find out you can't do it and you've got to make changes. Um, so it's, it's the same sort of thing. Uh, thank you for that insight into your process. So when you're writing that tight plot, as uh, as as PW says, are you 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 are both knowing where you want to go, but you're a leaving room for creative freedom in terms of how you may sure. get there. So I'm interested to know that you know who done it from the beginning. So in movie land, before you set pen to paper or keyboard to hand or whatever the modern version would be, you knew how the ending was going to go down. Is yeah. that right? Okay, yeah. cool. and I, to me, I'm sure it's true of anybody in any profession. When I read a book written by someone who's a pantser, it is so obvious to me. I can see them treading narrative water while they try to figure out where to go next. I can see their rush to try to explain something that occurred to them before that doesn't fit in now. It's so painfully obvious 90% of the time. And, and people are surprised when, when I'll be on a panel with them and they'll say, you're seeing the pants or an outliner. And I said, well, I'm an outliner, unlike you know, Sarah next to me. And, and Sarah would go, how did you know? Well, I read your book. Um, that doesn't mean it's bad necessarily. And I'm not referring to this actual Sarah and her book, but uh, which is wonderful. <laughs> um, but that, that, think, That's going to be the blurb on the cover. I am not referring to this Sarah. <laughs> I, I think in a mystery, especially a whodunit, you need to know exactly what the clues are and how they fit together. You need to know who the killer was so that you can perform the magic trick of misdirecting the reader with other stuff while you're, you're being honest with them about the clues. Because I, I like to believe that anybody can go back and reread one of my books and see every clue they missed. I'm not pulling stuff out of my butt. <laughs> you know, it's like, I, I'm not doing what Rex Stout sometimes did. It's like between chapters, I sent someone to the morgue and found this information. No, I share everything with the reader and same with the viewer. When I write mysteries for television, everything is on the screen. You can re you know, after the, the episode's over, you go look at it again and see every clue you missed. And I don't think you can do that when you're making it up as you go along. I, I think there's the great the great thing about a mystery and the bad thing is it's a compelling story, but it's also a magic trick. It's it's a game. It's I, I'm, I don't want readers to see that the wall is false or that the, the rabbit is, is not a real rabbit. And this, I mean, you, you want to have them looking at other things and all the red herrings and all the other, I have them focusing on the time the murder took place. And everyone's asking about the time the murder took place when it's irrelevant. It has nothing to do with that. I'm distracting you. Ooh. That you can't do if you don't have the plot already in mm, your head. Mm, mm, like you it. Of all this stuff. Thank you, Lee. I feel like I'm taking a masterclass on writing. Lynn, great question. She would like to know, since this book was uh, based on actual crimes, how did you manage the reality versus the fiction? I'm wondering too. Thanks, uh, Lynn. Well, actually my previous, I can't get this right, previous uh, Eve Ronan book, Lost Hills, was also based on a real case. And I take the elements that intrigue me and I fictionalize the rest. I make it up. Because um, I don't think, the actual resolution of the sniper killings here is that entertaining or maybe even accurate to tell you the truth it's still up in the air about whether or not the police or the sheriff's department has gotten it right but i, I just if i in fact if lost hills if i had told that story the way it really went down no one would believe it they'd say oh that's over the top because i actually had to bring the story down in lost hills to make it more realistic because no one would believe the reality because truth was stranger than fiction so i i do whatever i think will make it a great story, but also I think less about the story than how the story will reveal character of my protagonist. How will it bring out the best or worst of my protagonist? How will it put my protagonist 
in conflict? How will it give my protagonist something at stake? How will solving this crime or not solve this crime cost him or her something dear? It's Because the crimes, you could do these crimes on any book or any show. The key is, is the story that can only be told with Eve Ronan? Is the story that can only be told with Adrian Monk? Then it works. If you could tell that story with any other detective in the lead, then your story is a mess. So that's the, the bar I set for myself. Is this a story that would work with any other detective? And if it wouldn't, if it's only a story that Eve Ronan could solve or a mystery only Eve Ronan could solve in this way, then I know it works. Um, Lynn, thank you for the great question. Uh, Lee, thank you for the fabulous answer. Let's get over to Mark. Mark, welcome to the conversation. Thank you so much for joining us. He would like to know, how often has the ending in one of your novels deviated from your outline? I'm wondering too. Very rarely, maybe 10% of the time. I mean, the, the solution won't change. Maybe how I arrive at it, maybe the, the action climax, um, Maybe the, the the way it comes out, but the solution of the crime, who done it, that never changes. I, I've never never changed that at all. Now I have changed, you know, maybe my original outline. I'm making this up. Had you know seven people in a room, and the detective goes, "And Sarah did it," but instead I end up putting it in an airplane that's crashing, and as they're losing altitude and about to slam into the ground, the detective reveals who done it. You know, I might find a more interesting, compelling way to have that resolution. Um, but I knew how, how Movie Land and Lost Hills and every one of the books in the Eve Ronan series was going to end before I wrote them. Very cool. Um, yeah, because Mark, that's a really interesting question, though, because Lee sharing that he, you know, that he does do this outline, but it's a living outline. He knows where he's going. He knows he's going to take the 10 freeway most of the way. But uh, I was wondering, too, could that destination end? I've never, I've never changed who done it. I, I might okay. change how we discover who done it. I mm. might add some new action or, or, new doubt about with the detective i might add a new red herring but the res the ultimate resolution that sarah Devello murdered the author while they were doing a zoom and somehow got away with it i will reveal how that was done and that's always been that will always be i won't deviate from that i, I have my gimmick i have my you know my interesting crime i have my false leads and all that but maybe how i get there and how i dramatize it that might change but never who done it uh, very interesting peek behind the curtain here. Uh, Bookmarks magazine raving a beautifully cinematic novelist who strikes a precise balance between darkness and humor. So clearly your TV writing talent and experience is shining through on the page there, Lee, and being recognized by Bookmarks um, and and praising your ability to, to, to incorporate uh, humor and darkness in in the, in this book and on the on the page your response thank you <laughs> I, I appreciate the praise i'm not sure i deserve it um but it is something i think about all the time not my ability to do it but well yeah i guess my ability i, I am constantly thinking about the balance between the humor and the drama and there have been many times where i have cut the funny i've cut the funny. cutting the the drama um though i have a mentor who, who since passed away who used to tell me never cut the funny <laughs> um, sometimes I do. Did he cut the funny after 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 you after after you became enraged at his feedback? No, no, no. He was he was a good. Um, he'd say, "Do whatever you can to save the joke." I didn't. Oh, always good. Need that that advice. We have two minutes left. I can squeeze in one, maybe two questions. Uh, so let us know if you have any questions. I do want to get, I do let people submit questions in advance in Mystery and Thriller Mavens. So I do want to get to one of those. This one from Anna. She would like to know, Lee, do you have a favorite character or two characters you would like to be stuck on a desert island with? Who and why? Great question, Anna. Thank you. I'd like to be stuck with Scotty so he could transport me out of there to the Enterprise. I guess. I okay. guess the other person I'd be stuck with is, a, is someone who's great at building boats out of palm fronds and sand. Uh, Have you written that character, Lee? <laughs> no, no, I haven't, but I, I, I should. Okay, okay. So a built boater or or a built builder, bu a, a boat, boat builder. builder, or someone with boat. a transporter <laughs> beam to get me off that damn island, so I don't have to sit there with them for eternity. Gilligan's <laughs> Island. I love it. Bookgasm raving that Movie Land is an entertaining and twisty tale of murder and long-held secrets 
secrets in a picturesque portion of Southern California. Um, and I did want to share one last review, actually two deadly pleasure saying an intelligently written series with memorable characters and intriguing plus Lee Goldberg is one of those authors with natural born storytelling and gifts. Lee, do you think it is natural born or do you think you've honed it over the course of your career or both? I think it's both because my brother is an author, New York Times mm -hmm. bestselling author, Todd Goldberg. My sisters are both artists. Um, writing seems to run in the family. My uncle is, a, is an author. My parents are both journalists. So clearly the writing gene is in our DNA. But my brother is more of a literary novelist than I am. Okay, okay. Um, so this is the fourth book in the Eve Ronin series, Mystery Scene, saying that it is splendidly compelling. How many more books do you think we'll see in this Eve series, Lee? I hope a lot more. It depends on all of you rushing out right now and buying 10 copies of Movie Land because mm -hmm. it is a commercial enterprise. Obviously, whether there's a fifth book really depends on whether the fourth book is a success or a crushing failure. But you will, but you would like to, you would, you would like to. I would be happy writing an Eve Ronan book every year. I mean, that's yeah. why I've started her so young and so flawed. It's going to oh. take a long time before she's Harry Bosch. Okay. Okay. So you, so you intentionally created her. She's now 26 in this book because you wanted her to have a longer runway than Donuts, for instance, who's, who's. But also who's a longer everybody. runway as a detective. I didn't want her yeah. starting as competent and sure of herself and brilliant and everybody mm. knowing it. I wanted to see the evolution to see her go from whatever it is she is, you know, the homicide detective she is now to sheriff, the LA County Sheriff's Department in book 30, who knows? But okay. I want to see that, that, that process of her becoming the ultimate version of herself. Oh, I love that. A long I way to get there. Thinking ahead. I love that. Um, you guys, the book is out tomorrow. Eve wrote in book four. So pre-order now. And the good folks at Murder by the Book will put it in the mail to you tomorrow. And Lee, if anyone wants to send me their receipt for Murder by the Book, I will send Lee some of my very special homemade bookmarks that I personally make. Um, and Lee will personalize them for you. I'm putting Lee on the spot, but I know how I'll be glad it. to do that. Yay. All right. So pre-order now here's the link then click over buy it send me your receipt on any instagram twitter facebook i do it all dm it to me and i will have lee personalized eve ronan book four movie land out tomorrow just for you with a special secret message um lee goldberg thank you for coming on thank you all for spending your afternoon with us um and uh lee we will look forward to eve number five come back and talk to us then i will thank you so much all right, everybody, have a great day. I'll see you tonight at 7 and 8 Eastern, 6 and 7 Central with Isabella Maldonado and Faye Snowden. See you then.